This video is a follow-up to the uh, the post I put. Thanks, Matt, for the t-shirt, brother. Looks good. Uh, um, about uh, uh, you know when 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 do you decide or how do you decide when a, a dog or a female is is uh, good enough for breeding? But first, you know, I'm gonna put a disclaimer. Uh, Unfortunately, I have to keep repeating this because, and, and it's okay because not everybody sees all of my vids, not everybody reads the rules, which they should. But the group is there for historical purposes. It's there for learning and sharing. I'll admit I don't know everybody personally that's on the group, and secret, private, all that, whatever it means, you know, there, there's. There's a way for people, and even Facebook, which I've been checked by Facebook about some of my comments or, or you know, selling stuff or whatever, and stuff has been deleted by Facebook for its content. I don't never respond to Facebook. I just let it go. But the rules are there for a reason. They're there for the protection of the of the uh, group members. You know, everybody knows my position. I don't have dogs. I haven't been around dogs. Everything I talk is of a historical nature, and I talk about the past. Uh, none of it's current, even though sometimes when I speak, you know, on, on a video, it sounds current. It's not. It's just my way of talking. But And, and I'm not saying people are active uh, that are in the group. But the fact that if you own dogs or you have dogs or you post your dogs or you try and sell puppies or, or, or stud service or dogs or whatever, you know, that you have to be careful. Somebody's always watching. And, and like I said, I don't know everybody personally. The way I accept members is if I know you, I'll, I'll let you in the group. If I don't know you, then I have to know the person that's that wants you to be added to the group. So if I delete someone that, and it's not someone I added personally or that I know personally, then that responsibility falls on the person that added you. Now it doesn't look like it, or, or maybe people don't follow, or you can't follow. But I've deleted a lot of people, and and there's still a lot of people on there. But but. Like I said, the rules are there for a reason. I don't want anybody getting in trouble for historical stuff or fabricated stuff or hypothetical questions. So, if you have a question or you want some knowledge or, or you want to learn or you just want to follow along, that's great. But, but when you get personal with somebody or you start bashing people or breeders... Or you start putting current stuff down, and you know that 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 that's not what the group is about. Do that on your own page. Do don't do it in the group. That's not what it's for. And and uh, you know it's it's it, this this is just a general. I don't want to say warning, but some general advice, because it's been known, and it's a fact. That people follow others on Facebook or Facebook follows people on Facebook and that's how someone can get in trouble. For example, there was a video put on a couple of years ago of these people letting their dog kill a raccoon or something. They got in trouble for it. It's the content. And when you have visual content, it, content it, it's a lot. It means a lot more to those that are watching than it does if you just talk. But even the talking can get you in trouble. That, that's been that's happened too. That's a fact. So keep it civil, keep it clean, and and you know, enjoy the group. It's been on for a lot of years. I've never been uh uh you know put in Facebook jail or anything like that. My groups have never been deleted, and I like to think because of the rules that we have and and you know, the integrity of the members that are in the group. That makes a big difference. So that's a little disclaimer, but to get on with the video, you know, 
uh, I posted something short, and I'm going to give my my experiences and my and I'm going to I'm going to look at both sides sometimes, you know. So so you have to, <coughs> you know, follow along and and hopefully you can understand what what I'm talking about. Uh, I posted, you know, generally if I felt a dog or or or, or uh, you know, male or female, if I saw what I needed to see out of them and I felt they fit the standards of my breeding program, then I would breed them. Before their career, during their career, after their career, it didn't matter to me. Some old timers, you know, they like to wait till a, a, a male is done with his career because they, you know, in their mind, it, it can mess with their head. You know, it makes them act funny. I never had that problem because my males didn't breed anyways, females, they didn't, you know, it was real hard to breed them naturally. So that's why I use artificial ins insemination. With the females, it's wear and tear on their body. So some people don't like to, uh, didn't like to use them in competition uh, because, you know, uh, and they would wait till after their career was over to breed them because of that wear and tear on their body. and and. There's speculation that there's a hormonal change after you breed them, and that can have an effect on their mentality when it comes to the competition side. But for me, that that didn't matter. I bred them before or after, uh, during or whatever, you know. And and uh, uh, I I never had any any uh, uh, negative results or negative behavior from a dog or a female for doing that. Others may have. That's their experience. You know, everything I did with the dogs, with every one of them, was with that mindset, I'm going to use them for competition. That's the reason I got into the dogs in the first place. So whatever mentality that, that comes along with that, that's what I tried to put in their head. When it's time to do work, you work. And, and the breeding side, that's a different mentality. That, that, that's that's kind of how I felt about it. Now, now, I didn't keep curs, and I'll give you an example. Because it was mentioned on there, you know, what do you do? And it's a good question. What do you do if you bred them, and then they quit after you breed them? And I don't know if everybody saw the post, but there's you have two options. Dog quits after you breed it. You, you, can, you can call that dog, and you can call everything off of it. The second option is... If it quits after you bred it, is you can call that dog and then go through everything that's off of it and just be extra hard. Test them from that point on. Be harder on them because of what their sire or dam did. You know, people have done one or the other. And I'm not going to judge, you know, what, what's the right thing to do or what you should do. But I'll give you an example of what I did. I had one female... I bred her, uh, and then she ended up quitting later. She was, she was a one-time winner, best in show winner. She lost to a champion. Okay, now, now that particular family of dogs, they, they were kind of iffy, anyways. And and what I mean by iffy is they weren't durable. They they were thin boned. The plus side, they were fast and they were hard mouth, but they weren't good enough. To keep in my program so what I did is I called her I had a sister I sold the sister the sister beat a two-time winner uh, and then you know I sold her to my friend he won with her and then he sold her too because he realized why I, I got rid of her uh, in the first place and and uh, I only bred her one time she only had two pups and I sold those pups to a fancier and he brought one of them back and I won with him. Both of them turned out good enough to match. And and uh, one brother got stolen. The other brother, I, I used him, sent him back to his owner, and he got stolen too. But those breedings, I just took them out of my, my family of dogs. And and they're, they're, those breedings, they're in some pets. Those dogs are still in the background of some pets, but they're not in the background of my pets. You know, people liked them, people used them, but for me, they weren't good enough for breeding.
So, you know, uh, when, when you have standards, I talk about them all the time. I'm a sticker. And, and sometimes it may seem like I'm going against what I've, what I've talked about. And what I'm really doing, I'm just showing the other side. I'll say someone else did this or someone wants to breed a cold dog or they kept the dog after it quit because it wasn't right and, it, and it's keeping this and that, you know. And I've said here before, you know, my fault, your fault, his fault, dog's fault, nobody's fault. I called my curs. And part of the reason for that is <coughs> I didn't feel that I would properly take care of them after they quit. I just didn't like them. And, and you know, people are not going to agree with that. And I could have gave them away, yeah, and I could have, you know, spayed them and put them uh, with someone else. But I didn't do that either. I didn't want my blood out. I didn't want my dogs out. I didn't want anything coming back to me over a dog that I just sold or gave away to the general public. You know, that, 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 that kind of stuff follows you. So I would cull it. And as I've mentioned before, sometimes dogs are good enough for matching. They were good enough for matching for me, but they weren't good enough for breeding. That's okay, because I had fun doing it. And I won with some, lost with some, won and lost with some. I had a good time doing it. I was real competitive, and I enjoyed it. But when it comes down to breeding, that's where my standards kick in. And, and what can help you are, are a few things. Because the consensus with some people is gameness is not passed on. You can't breed for it. Uh, uh, you know, like I said, there's been, there's been cold dogs that throw great dogs. And there's been curs that, that produce champions, this and that, grand champions, this and that. That's all true. But that, that all that doesn't matter to me. Because over long term, when you take those negatives out of it, you're going to have more success. Those those dogs that, that, that come from curs or come from cold dogs or, or subpar dogs, you know, maybe they're not durable. Maybe they're not, you know, like I said, thin bone or something like that. Maybe they're too thin boned or they have some freaky behaviors, this and that, you know. They, they can throw good dogs, but they're intermittent. It's not, they're not, on, it doesn't happen on a consistent basis. And whatever standards you have, you should follow them. If your standard tells you to do this, do it. Over time, you'll see the success and you'll have better percentages. So some of the things that will help you is, is if I bred to a dog that fit my standard, it was everything I liked about it. I'm going to try to breed to the best one of that litter. But it's also important that the litter mates were good within that litter. That, that, that gives me a percentage, let's say 50% or better, is what I went off of. If it was... Lower than that, then, then, you know, maybe I might not breed those dogs. I might just use them. So it's important that the litter worked. It's also important that the parents of the dog or the male or female that I'm breeding were proven as well. Hopefully winners, but at least proven dogs. And producers by the fact that that litter, uh, the, the dog or female that I'm using out of that litter worked out and her litter mates worked out. So at least in that one litter, the parents were productive. And generally, you know, I bred them more than once, so they had other litters that I could judge their productivity on also. And thirdly, the grandparents, same thing. Their litter mates were good. They were good. And they were good producers. So in that respect, you have three generations there. You have a litter that worked out. You have the parents that worked out. And you have the grandparents, all four of them, that worked out. If you use that as a standard, just those three generations, you're going to have consistent percentages of good dogs. Now, we can argue the fact. We can say this or that. But that is standard in any breeding program with any animal, with anything in agriculture, with any, uh, I don't care if it's bees or butterflies or whatever. Those are just, that, that, that's, that's something that has been constant and consistent in all forms of breeding. 
right? And, and you know, I don't like excuses. I don't like defeatist attitudes. Some people, you know, say I don't think outside of the box or, or you know, I'm a stickler for this or that. It, it's not that. It's stuff that is proven, not just by me, but by others. And, and back in the day, we had to be observant of everything, not just our dogs, but other people's dogs. You have to travel and see other people's dogs, or you have to go in this area and that area and compete against people from, from different areas. And you have to get a lot of experience before you know what you're looking at. Because there's different scenarios, there's different situations. You know, e even for gameness, people, people, you know, I've seen, I've seen the dogs show game. It's no question. Some will call it a cur. You'll see these match reports where, uh, you know, the dog took a count. Well, you have to do some research. Why did he take a count? Because if he's trying to go, but he can't, not physically able, that's not a cur. If he, if he's trying as hard as he can, he can, and the count it's a 10 count. He gets over there on the 11 count. Well, he's counted out. He lost. Doesn't mean that's a cur. And they'll show you way before it gets to that point whether they're going to quit or not. You just have to know what you're looking at. So whether, you know, I tried to use every good dog that I competed with that won. And, and if they lost, they lost game. Those are the ones I bred. Sometimes the dogs don't get to that point. They may lose some teeth. They may suffer a fracture or an injury that, that, where you can't compete with them. If they're still good enough to breed, yeah, I would breed them. One of the best females I had was Lucy. And she was as good as you need. She wasn't a super ace dog, but she was a bad bitch. And she was tough. And she had good mouth. And she was strong and fast, all the things I like in a bulldog, but she was a chain fighter. She was destructive, she busted all her teeth. Some people might take a chance with a female like that and, and compete with her and they could win. I didn't want to take the chance, but I knew what she was about. And her litter was a good litter. She was the only female in the litter. Her sire was a champion, her mother was a one-time winner and her mother had already produced winners. So for me, she was one of my brute bitches. And, and she proved it when I bred her. Her first litter had four pups in it. All of them were winners. All of them were game. And because she had come from a line of dogs, I did this too, and I did it one time. So I'm not, I'm not saying that people should follow this or do it. But after five generations of breeding, I knew, you know, what my blood was about, and I knew, I knew my dogs. And so I took the two females out of her litter and I looked at them then I bred them then I checked them and due to circumstances I had to sell that whole litter but one female was a three-time winner Joey made her a three-time winner and Frankie made the other sister a two-time winner both of them threw good pups too and I posted their pictures it's Kay and Bambi Kay was key in, in uh, being the foundation, part of the foundation of one of my friend's family of dogs. So it carried over. And it comes directly from those standards that I mention all the time. That the litter has to turn out, the parents have to be good, the grandparents have to be good. And hopefully behind that, there's good dogs also. So... We don't have any control over the dogs behind our dogs. There's quitters everywhere. There's cold dogs everywhere. But it's what you're going to do with what you have. And I'm not saying I didn't breed curs, but by the time I had to leave the dogs, all the dogs that I bred that were my family of dogs, there's no quitters in there. And that's just something that, 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 you know, was important to me. So the reason we have these rules 
is number one, we want consistency. Number two is if you're in doubt, you fall back on your rules. What is your what does your standards tell you to do? Because if you're going to live your life, well, I should have done this and I should have done that. And well, you know, this cold dog did that and this curd dog did that. Yeah, you're going to have good dogs. But but you're not going to have long term success. It's going to be intermittent and you're going to have good dogs here and there. But on a whole, you're not going to be looking out in your yard and say, man, all them grown dogs are good ones. And all them grown dogs have been proven. And back in the day, if you did that, it, you know, it didn't matter if you had five dogs or 25 dogs. If they were adults, they should all be good ones. The only ones should be questioned are the young ones coming up and the pups. It, it sounds kind of harsh. People say you can't do that. This is bullshit. Because it ain't just me. It's a lot of other people. No matter what them old timers tell you, look at what they did, not, not what they say. People say all kinds of stuff. Sometimes it's to throw you off. Sometimes it's to lie on purpose. Sometimes they're messing with you. You know, look at their record. Look at what they did. Look at how they do things. If you have the opportunity to be mentored by someone, listen to them. You can agree or disagree with them later. But, but, Regardless, you're going to learn something if you got your ears open and your mouth shut. And that's kind of what the group is about. Because it doesn't matter what, what you're doing now with the dogs. That, that history is important and you can learn from it. Just like any history in, our, in, in any human history. We can learn from the good. We can learn from the mistakes. We can learn why and what people are doing. And, and regardless of what it is, you can apply a lot of things to the dogs, including feed, health. We can't do what we did with them back in the day. That doesn't mean you, you, you can't have good dogs. Health and vitality and vigor and, and, and constitution, those, you can still apply those to the dogs of today, and you can do a lot of different things with them. You know, there's legal sports and hunting, you know. Just don't be too eager to post stuff that you shouldn't post because then it's going to come back on you. And, 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 and it could come back on the group. If you have good dogs, you, you know it. People will know it. If, if you have integrity, same thing. You have a good reputation, same thing. There's nothing to prove there. But there's a lot of learning that we can do. So the standard for gameness, mine, mine were always the same. It didn't, it didn't vary. And, and, you know, maybe I didn't have a whole bunch of dogs, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dogs like people do over the year. But I had enough of them to know that what I was doing worked. And it continued on after I got out of the dogs. So something was right, and, and it's not too hard to figure out. Have rules, stick to them. Even if something goes south a little bit sometimes, which it'll happen, for the most part, things are going to go right for you. So, you know, hopefully people understand what I'm talking about, and, and uh, we'll get some good comments in the group. Feel, feel free to comment, and uh, I appreciate it. Everybody's input. Thank you.